Uh, this is also written in the form, uh, it's the K that's on the right-hand side. Actually, that's, I found that a source of considerable difficulty. And uh, in general, it is. Uh, the, uh, it's for these, uh, the temperature concentration model, it's natural to have the K on the right-hand side and to separate out the QE as part of it. Uh, Another model for which that's true is mixing, as I'll, I think I'll show you on Monday. Um, on the other hand, there are some common first-order models for which it's not a natural way to separate things out. Uh, examples would be uh, the, RLs, the RC circuit, uh, um, radioactive decay, stuff like that. So this is not of universal utility but I thought that that form of writing it was of sufficient utility to make a special case and, and uh, emphasize it very heavily in the notes. Let's look at the equation and uh, uh, this, this form will be good enough, the y prime. When you solve it, let me remind you that how the solutions look because that explains the terminology. Uh, the solution looks like, after you've done the integrating factor and multiplied through and integrated both sides, you know, in short, what you're supposed to do. The solution looks like y equals, there's the term e to the negative k out front times an integral which you can either make definite or indefinite according to your preference. Uh, q of t times e to the kt inside dt. It will help you to remember the opposite signs if you think that when q is a constant, 1 for example, uh, you want the, these two guys to cancel out and produce a constant solution. That's a good way to remember that the signs have to be opposite. But I don't encourage you to remember the formula at all. I'm only, it's just a convenient thing to be able to, for me to be able to use right now. And then there's the other term which comes by putting out the arbitrary constant explicitly, c e to the negative k, t. So you can either write it this way, where this is somewhat vague, uh, and or you can make it definite by putting a 0 here and a t there and uh, change the dummy variable inside according to the uh, way the notes tell you to do it. Now, when you do this, and if k is positive, that's absolutely essential, only when that is so, then this term, as I told you a, few, a week or so ago, this term goes to 0 because k is positive as t goes to infinity. So this goes to 0 as t goes, and it doesn't matter what c is uh, as t goes to infinity. This term is, stays some sort of function. And so this term is called the steady state or long-term solution, or uh, it's, it's called both, the long-term solution. And this, which disappears, gets smaller and smaller as time goes on, is therefore called the transient, because it disappears as uh, the time increases to infinity. So this part uses the initial condition, uses the initial value, let's call it y of 0, assuming that you started the initial value at t when t was equal to 0, which is a common thing to do, although, not, of course, not necessary. Uh, the starting value appears in this term. This one is just some function. Now, the general picture of the way that looks is the steady state solution will be some solution like I don't know, like that, let's say. So that's the steady state solution, the SSS. What do the other guys look like? Well, the steady state solution has this starting point. Other, other solutions can have any of these other starting points. So in the beginning, they won't look like the steady state solution. But we know that as time goes on, they must approach it, because this term represents the difference between the solution and the steady state solution. So this term is going to 0, and therefore whatever these guys do to start out with 
after a while, they must follow the steady state solution more and more closely. They must, in short, be asymptotic to it. So the solutions to any equation of that form will look like this. Even if they, you know, up here, maybe it started at 127, that's okay. After a while, it's going to start approaching that green curve. Of course, they won't cross each other, but they're sort of like a, you know, that's the rock star, and these are the groupies trying to get close to it. Uh, the, uh, now, but something follows from that picture, which is the truth, which is the steady state solution? What, in short, is so special about this green curve? All these other white solution curves have that same property, the same property that if that uh, all the they're all all the other white curves and the green curve too are trying to get close to them. In other words, uh, there is nothing special about the green curve. It's just that they all want to get close to each other. And therefore, there isn't, though you can write a formula like this, there isn't one steady state solution. There are many. Now, this produces vagueness. You know, so you talk about the steady state solution. Which are you talking about? And I have no answer to that. Uh, whichever one, the usual answer is whichever one looks simplest. Normally, the one that will look simplest is the one where c is 0. But if this is a peculiar function, it might be that for some other value of c, uh, you get an even simpler expression. So the steady state solution, about the best I can say, either use integrate that, don't use an arbitrary constant, and use what you get, or pick the simplest. Pick the value of c, which makes this, which make, gives you the simplest answer. Pick the simplest function. And call that, that's what's usually called the steady state solution. Now, <clears throat> from that point of view, the, what I'm calling the uh, input in this input response point of view, which we're going to be using, by the way, constantly, well, pretty much all term long, but certainly for the next month or so, uh, I'm constantly going to be coming back to it. The input is the Q of t. In other words, it seems rather peculiar, but the input is the right-hand side uh, of the equation, of the differential equation, and the reason is because I'm always thinking of this temperature model. The external water bath at temperature T external. The internal thing here, the problem is, given this function, the external water bath temperature is driving, so to speak, the temperature of the inside. And therefore, the input is the temperature of the water bath. I don't like the word output, although it would be the natural thing, uh, because this temperature doesn't look like an output. Uh, anyone might be willing to say, yeah, you're inputting the value of the temperature here. Uh, this, it's more like the normal term is response. This thing is the, the, this plus the water bath is a little system, and the response of the system, i.e., the change in the internal temperature, is governed by the driving external temperature. So the input is Q of t, and the response of the system is the solution to the differential equation. Now, if the thing is special, as it's going to be for most of this period, uh, if it has that special form, then I'm going to, I really want to call Q sub e the input. Uh, I want to call Q sub e the input and, and uh, there is no standard way of doing that, although there's a most common way. Uh, I'm, so I, I'm just calling it the physical input. In other words, the temperature input or the concentration input. Uh, and by that will be my Q E of T. And by the subscript E, you'll understand that I'm writing it in that form and thinking of this model or a concentration model, or a mixing model, as I'll show you on Monday. By the way, some, 
this is often handled. I mean, how would you handle this to get rid of a k? Well, divide through by k. So this equation is often in the literature written this way. 1 over k times y prime plus y is equal to, well, now they call it q of t, not qe of t, because they've gotten rid of this funny factor. But I'll continue to call it qe. So in other words, in this part, this is just frankly called the input. One doesn't say physical or anything. And this is the solution, is then the response. And this funny coefficient of y prime, that's not in standard linear form, is it, anymore? But uh, it's, uh, it's a standard form if you want to do this input uh, response analysis. Um, so this is also a way of writing the equation. Uh, I'm not going to use it because how many standard forms can this poor little course absorb? Uh, I'll, I'll stick to that one. OK. Uh, <clears throat> you have then the uh, superposition principle, which I don't think I'm going to. Uh, the solution, uh, which solution? Well, the, normally it means any, any, any solution, or in other words, the steady state solution. Now notice that terminology only makes sense if k is positive. And in fact, there is nothing like, the picture doesn't look at all like this if k is negative. And therefore, the, the terms would steady state, transient, would be totally inappropriate if k were negative. Uh, so this assumes definitely that k has to be greater than 0. Otherwise, no. So I'll call this the physical input. And then you have the superposition principle, uh, which I really can't improve upon what's written on the notes, the superposition of inputs. Whether they're physical inputs or non-physical inputs, if, Q, if the input Q of t produces the response uh, Y of t, and Q2 of t produces the response Y2 of t, then a simple calculation with the differential equation shows you by, so to speak, adding that the sum of these two, I stated it very generally in the notes, but uh, is corresponds, we'll have as the response Y1, the steady state response Y1 plus Y2, and a constant times Q1 will have as the response uh, the constant times Y1. That's an expression, essentially, of the linear. It uses the fact, the special form of the equation, and it's, we'll have a, be, a very efficient and elegant way of seeing this when we study higher order equations. Uh, for now, I'll just, the little calculation that's done in the notes will suffice for first order equations. If you don't have a complicated equation, there's no point in making a fuss over proofs using it. So, uh, but it essentially uses the fact that the equation is linear, or that's bad, so linearity of the ODE. In other words, it's a consequence of the fact that the equation looks the way it does. And something like this would not in any sense be true if the equation, for example, had here a, a y squared instead of y. Uh, all, everything I'm saying this period would be total nonsense and totally inapplicable. Now, today, uh, what I wanted to discuss was what's in the notes that I gave you today, which is what happens when the physical input is trigonometric. For certain reasons, that's the most important case there is. Uh, it's because of the existence of what are called Fourier series, and there are a couple of words about them. That, that's something we'll be studying in about three weeks or so. Uh, but in what's going on roughly is that, so I want the physical in, so I'm going to take the equation in the form y prime plus ky equals k times qe of t. And the input that I'm interested in is when this is uh, a simple one that you used on the, uh, uh, the visual that you uh, did, got two points of work two points worth of work for handing in today, uh, cosine omega t. 
So if you like, uh, K here. So the QE is cosine omega t. That was the physical input. And uh, omega, as you know, is, uh, you have to be careful when you use the word frequency. I, I assume you got this from a physics class oh, last semester. But anyway, just to remind you, uh, there's a whole yoga of five or six terms that go whenever you're talking about trigonometric functions. Uh, I, instead of giving a long explanation, the end of the second page of the notes just gives you a reference list of what you're expected to know for 1803 and physics as well uh, with a uh, brief one or two line description of what each of those means. So think of it as an, you know, something to look up, refer back to uh, if you've forgotten. But omega is what's called the uh, angular frequency or the circular frequency. It's uh, somewhat misleading to call it the frequency, although I probably will. It's the angular frequency. It's, in other words, it's the number of complete oscillations. This cosine omega t is going up and down, right? Uh, so a complete oscillation is it goes down and then returns to where it started. That's a complete oscillation. This is only half an oscillation because you didn't give it a chance to get back. OK, so the number of complete oscillations in how much time, well, in 2 pi, in the distance 2 pi on the t-axis, in the interval of length 2 pi. Because, for example, if omega is 1, cosine t takes 2 pi to repeat itself, right? If omega were 2, it would repeat itself. It would make two complete oscillations in the interval 2 pi. So it's, it's what happens in the interval 2 pi, not what happens in the time interval 1, which is the natural meaning of the word frequency. There's always this factor of 2 pi that floats around to make all your formulas and solutions incorrect. OK, now, so what I'm out to do is, the problem is, for the physical input, QE, cosine omega t, find the response. In other words, solve the differential equation. In short, for your, the visual that you looked at, I think I've forgotten the colors now. Uh, the uh, input was in green, maybe. Uh, but I do remember that the response is in yellow. I think I remember that. <laughs> so find the response yellow. And the input was, what color was it, green? Blue, blue. Light blue. OK, so we got to solve the, we, we, we got to solve the differential equation. Now, it's a question of how I'm going to solve the differential equation. I'm going to use complex numbers throughout, A, because that's the way it's usually done, B, to give you practice using complex numbers, and I don't think I need any other reasons. So I'm going to use complex numbers. I'm going to complexify. To use complex numbers, what you do is complexification of the problem. So I'm going to complexify the problem. Turn it into the domain of complex numbers. So take the differential equation. Turn it into a differential equation involving complex numbers. Solve that. And then go back to the real domain to get the answer. Since it's easier to integrate exponentials. And therefore, try to introduce, try to change the trigonometric functions into complex exponentials because the, simply because the work will be easier to do. All right, so let's do it. Uh, to change this differential equation, remember, I've got cosine omega t here. I'm going to use the fact that uh, e to the i omega t, Euler's formula, that the real part of it is cosine omega t. So I'm going to view this as the real part of this complex function, but I'll throw in the imaginary part, too, since at one point we'll need it. Now, what is the equation, then, that it's going to turn into? Sorry.
the complexified equation is going to be y prime plus ky equals, and now instead of the right-hand side, k times cosine omega t, I'll use the whole complex exponential. E i omega t. Now, I have a problem because y here in this equation, y means the real function which solves that problem. I therefore cannot continue to call this y because I want y to be a real function. I have to change its name. Since this is a complex function on the right-hand side, I'll have to e expect a complex solution to the differential equation. I'm going to call that complex solution y tilde. Now, if I call the comp, then that's the, what I would also use as a designation for the variable. So y tilde is the complex solution, and it's going to have the form y1 plus i times y2. It's going to be the complex solution. And now what I say is, so solve it, find this complex solution. So find the program is to find y tilde. That's the complex solution. And then I say all you have to do is take the real part of that, and that will answer the original problem. Then y1, then y1, that's the real part of it, right? It's a function. You know, like this is cosine plus sine. Oh, as it was over here, it'll naturally be something different. It'll be something different. But that part of it, the real part, will solve the original problem, the original real ODE. Now, you say, well, you um, I just expect us to believe that. Well, yes, in fact. Uh, I think uh, we got a lot to do. So since this is, the argument for this is given in the notes, uh, so read this in the notes. It only takes a line or two of standard work with differentiation. So read in, read in the notes the argument for that, why that's so. It just amounts to separating real and imaginary parts. OK, so let's uh, now solve this. Since that's our program, all we have to find is the solution. Well, uh, just use integrating factors uh, and um, just do it. So the integrating factor will be what? E to the, I'm not, I don't want to use that formula. So the integrating factor will be E to the uh, KT is the integrating factor. If I multiply through both sides by the integrating factor, then the left-hand side will become Y E to the KT, the way it always does, prime, Y tilde, sorry. And the right-hand side will be, now I'm going to start combining exponentials. It will be k times e to the power i times omega t plus k. I'm going to write that k plus omega t. Uh, k plus omega t. <laughs> I omega t plus k. Thank you. I omega t plus k, or k plus I omega t. Kt? <laughs> Sorry. So it's it's k times e to the i omega t times e to the kt. So that's k plus i omega times t. Sorry. So y tilde e to the kt is k divided by, now I integrate this. So it uh, essentially reproduces itself except you have to put down on the bottom k plus i omega. Now I'll take the final step. What's y tilde equals 
See, when you do it this way, then you don't get a messy-looking formula that you substitute into in that's scary-looking. This is never scary. Now, I'm going to do two things simultaneously. First of all, here, if I multiply, after I get the answer, I'm going to want to multiply it by e to the negative kt, right, to solve for y tilde. If I multiply this by e to the negative kt, then that just gets rid of the k that I put in, and I'm left back with e to the i omega t. So that side is easy. All that's left is e to the i omega t. Now, what's interesting is this thing out here, k plus i omega. I'm going to take a typical step of scaling it. I'm going to scale it. I'm going to divide the top and bottom by k. And what does that produce? 1 divided by 1 plus i times omega over k. What I've done is take these two separate constants and shown that the critical thing is their ratio. OK, now, what I have to do now is take the real part. Now, there are two ways to do this. There are two ways to do this. Both are instructive. So there are two methods. I have a multiplication. The problem is, of course, that these two things are multiplied together. And one of them is essentially in Cartesian form, and the other is essentially in polar form. You have to make a decision. Either go polar. Sounds like go postal, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> or worse, if you're like a bear. <laughs> Savage. Uh, <laughs> attack it savagely, which is, that's a very good aggressive attitude to have when doing a problem. Or we can go, or we can go Cartesian. Going polar is a little faster, and I think it's what's done in the notes. The notes don't do both of these. They just do the first. Uh, on the other hand, they give you a formula, which is the critical thing that you'll need to go Cartesian. I hope I can do both of them if we uh, don't, uh, if we sort of hurry along. How do I go polar? To go polar, what you want to do is express this thing in polar form. Now. One of the things I didn't emphasize enough, probably, when I talked to you about complex numbers last time is, so I'll remind you, which serves my conscience and uh, doesn't hurt yours. Suppose you have alpha as a complex number. See, this complex number is a reciprocal. The good number is what's down below. Unfortunately, it's downstairs. You should know, like you know the back of your hand, which nobody knows. Uh, 1 over alpha. Since 1 over alpha, so that's of the form, the number I'm interested in, that coefficient, is of the form 1 over alpha. Well, 1 over alpha times alpha is equal to 1. And from that, it follows, first of all, if I take absolute values, that the absolute value of 1 over alpha times the absolute value of this is equal to 1. So this is equal to 1 over the absolute value of alpha. I think you all knew that. Uh, I'm a little less certain you knew how to uh, take care of the angles. How about the argument? Well, the argument of 1 over the angle, in other words. The angle of 1 over alpha plus, because when you multiply angles add, remember that, plus the angle associated with alpha has to be the angle associated with 1. But what's that? 1 is out here. What's the angle of 1? 0. Therefore, the argument, the absolute value of this thing is 1 over the absolute value. That's easy. And you should know that the argument of 1 over alpha is equal to minus the argument of alpha. So when you take reciprocal, the angle turns into its negative. OK, I'm going to use that now uh, to turn, because my aim is to turn this into polar form. So let's do that someplace, uh, I guess, here.
So uh, <clears throat> I want the polar form for 1 over 1 plus i times omega over k. OK, I'll draw a picture. Here is 1. Here is omega over k. Let's call this angle phi. It's a natural thing to call it. It's a right triangle, of course. OK, now, this is going to be a complex number times e to an angle. Now, what's the angle going to be? Well. This is the complex number, the angle for the complex number. So the argument of the complex number 1 plus i times omega over k is how much? Well, there's the complex number 1 plus i over 1 plus i times omega over k. Its angle is phi. So the, ang the argument of this is phi. And therefore, the argument of its reciprocal is negative phi. So it's e to the minus i phi. And what's a? a is 1 over the absolute value of that complex number. Well, this is the absolute value of this complex number is 1 plus omega over k squared. So the a is going to be 1 over that, the square root of 1 plus omega over k, the quantity squared, times e to the minus i phi. You see, I did that. That's the critical step. In the, you must turn that coefficient, if you want to go polar, you must turn that coefficient, write that coefficient in the polar form. And for that, you need these basic facts about Draw the complex number, draw its angle, and so on and so forth. And now, what's there for the solution? Once you've done that, the work is over. What's the complex solution? The complex solution is this. I've just found the polar form for this, so I multiply it by e to the i omega t, which means the things add. So it's equal to a, this a, times e to the i omega t minus i times phi. Or in other words, it is, the coefficient is 1 over, this is a real number now, square root of 1 plus omega over k squared. And this is e to the, see if I get it right now. OK. And finally, now, what's the answer to our real problem? Why one the real answer? I don't mean, I mean the really real answer. Uh, what is it? Well, this is a real number. So I simply reproduce that as the coefficient out front. And for the other part, I want the real part of that. But you can write that down instantly. So let's recopy the coefficient. And then I want just the real part of this. Well, this is e to the i times some crazy angle. So the real part is the cosine of that crazy angle. So it's the cosine of omega t minus phi. And if somebody says, yeah, well, OK, I got the omega k. I, I know what that is. That came from the problem, the frequency, driving frequency, uh, driving angular frequency. That was omega and k, I guess. K was the conductivity, the thing which told you how uh, quickly the heat in that uh, uh, penetrated the walls of the little inner chamber. So that's OK. But what's this phi? Well, if phi, the best way to give phi is just to draw that picture. Uh, but if you want a formula for phi, phi will be, well, I guess for the picture, it's the arctangent of omega k divided by k over 1, which I don't have to put in. So it's. This number phi, in reference to this function, see, if the phi weren't there, this would be cosine omega t, and we all know what that looks like. The phi is called the phase lag, 
or phase delay, something like that. The phase lag of the function What does it represent? It represents, let me draw you a picture. Uh, let's let's draw, draw the pic, try to draw the picture like this. Here's cosine omega t. Now, regular cosine would look sort of like that, but I'll indicate that the frequency, the angular frequency is not one by making my cosine squinchy up a little too much. Everybody can tell that that's <laughs> the cosine on a limp axis, something for Salvador Dali. Okay. okay. There's, so there's our, there's cosine, uh, there's cosine of something. So, uh, what was it, blue? I don't have blue. Yes, I have blue. Okay, so now, now you'll know what I'm talking about because this looks just like the, the uh, screen on your computer when you put in the visual for this. Frequency response order one. So this is cosine omega t. Now how will cosine omega t minus phi look? Well, it'll be moved over. Let's, for example, suppose phi were, uh, suppose phi were pi over 2. Now, where's pi over 2 on the picture? Well, what I do is cosine omega t minus this, I move it over by one so that this point becomes that one, and it looks like the thing will look like this. In other words, I shove it over by, so this is the point where omega t equals pi over 2. It's not the value of t. It's not the value of t. It's the value of omega t. And when I do that, then the the blue curve has been shoved over one quarter, one quarter of its fate, one quarter of its total cycle, and that turns it, of course, into the sine curve, which I hope I can draw. So this goes up to there, and then it's got to get back through. See? Uh, let me stop there while I'm ahead. <laughs> so this is sine omega t, the yellow thing, but that's also, in another life, cosine of omega t minus pi over 2. The main thing is you don't subtract the pi. The pi over 2 is not being subtracted from the t. It's being subtracted from the whole expression. And this whole expression represents an angle which tells you where you are in the travel along cosine. T. When, this, when this quantity gets to be 2 pi, you're back where you started. That's not the distance on the t-axis, it's the, the angle through which you go through. In other words, this number describes where you are on the cosine cycle. It doesn't tell you, it's not aiming at telling you exactly where you are on the t-axis. The response function looks like, the response function looks like the square root of 1 plus omega over k squared times cosine omega t minus phi. And I asked you, I asked you on the problem set, if k goes up, in other words, if the conductivity is rises, if heat can get more rapidly from the outside to the inside, for example, how does that affect, how does that affect the amplitude, this is the amplitude A, and the phase lag? In other words, how does this affect the response? And now you can see, if k goes up, this fraction is becoming smaller. That means the denominator is becoming smaller, and therefore the amplitude is going up. What's happening to the phase lag? Well, the phase lag looks like this, phi. 1 omega over k. If k is going up, then the size of this side is going down, and the angle is going down. Now, that part is intuitive. I would have expected everybody to get that. Um, to get that, uh, if the heat gets in quickly, more quickly, then the amplitude will match more quickly 
the, the, this will rise and get fairly close to 1, in fact. And there should be uh, very little lag in the way the response follows the input. But how about the other one? Okay, I gave you two minutes. The other one you'll figure out yourself. <laughs>